already. All right, so backyard chicken keeping with gateway greening. Um, just a little background. I always like to make a little plug now with kind of our virtual since we have people kind of from all over, a little bit about gateway greening. Um, we use gardening and urban agriculture as tools for strengthening and educating people and strengthening communities. Um, we have over 200 projects around the region. Um, we provide beds, materials, soil, things like that to projects. If you're interested in joining a community garden or starting one, take a look at our website. Um, you can gonna, there's a tab under community projects, start or join a, a gateway greening garden. You can start there. We also have a school program through COVID. We've kind of put a lot of this stuff on pause, but we work a lot with teachers and educators to integrate the garden into the curriculum. We have a unique seed to STEM curriculum, which is on our website, which is K through five focused. And then we also do have a volunteer program. We're starting to open up for volunteering individually or groups out in gardens. Um, so if you are inter interested in volunteering individually, or if you work for, if you're part of some group that is interested in volunteering, you can reach out. Um, volunteer at gatewaygreening.org is the best way to get um, the information on that. All right, so we'll, we're, what we're gonna kind of go through today, we'll talk about the basics about chickens talk about if you can have, can you have chickens, kind of what you should be thinking about before you get chickens, having what to do with having chicks and then taking care of chickens. Um, there's a ton of information on the internet. Um, you can pull a lot of this stuff. So a lot of this is gonna be kind of what I've found from us taking care of our chickens at our demonstration garden, kind of best tips and things like that. Um, I think this presentation will go a little faster than an hour. So we'll have a good amount of time for questions at the end. Um, and kind of discussion as well. So just first a little bit about some chicken basics. Um, most breeds will le live between three to 10 years. It's a pretty big range of life of um, their ages. I mean, just it depends on the type of chicken you're getting, how they're treated, stuff like that. Most of the breeds that we buy that you kind of are seeing at kind of a garden store or a farm store or people's backyards usually you see little, lean more to the, like the five to 10 years. Um, and usually most of these breeds will be laying between five to seven years or so. So for a good amount of their life, though they do start slowing down, um, usually after year two to three. Um, and so just something to think about when you're getting chickens is how many you're getting at the beginning and whether you might add some more chickens in in a couple of years afterwards, once they've started to slow down their egg laying and kind of creating almost kind of some successions of chickens as well. Um, chickens really can't see well at night. And we'll talk a little bit about how you should be thinking about with design. Um, they can jump and fly a lot more than you think. Um, and some of the common breeds you see out there um, some barred rocks. I think that's what's in this picture right here. Rhode Island reds are pretty common. Um, Easter eggers are some pretty fun ones and we have those. Um, I threw silkies in here just because I hear people talk about them all the time. They're, I would categorize them, I guess, as if there are show chickens, I would consider them a show chicken and then Orpingtons as well. Um, when we're thinking, and this is kind of when we're getting into kind of the pre-chickens before we before you're getting them, kind of stuff to be thinking about is really designing your space um, to protect them from predators. Um, they have many natural predators. Um, chickens in the wild, though we've bred them to be this way, so really kind of phrasing them as being in the wild isn't really a great term. Um, but traditionally, a rooster is what would be defending the flock. Um, pretty much in every municipality or place that you live. If you live anywhere suburban or urban, um, you probably can't have a rooster. Um, and so for this, we need to be thinking about our design of the space um, to protect the chickens. So kind of on the ground, um, some pretty common animals, dogs, cats, um, raccoons, um, snakes, foxes, and possums. Um, and a couple of these definitely like raccoons. I've heard of people having chickens where raccoons have kind of reached their way through fences and just grabbed chickens and kind of broken their neck. Um, I haven't seen it too, I haven't seen it obviously with our chickens, but I have heard of it. So something to kind of think about. Um, and then in the air, um, owls and hawks are pretty common predators as well. And so thinking about kind of space above to protect chickens, um, whether 
mesh over the top, trees, just some type of protection so they're not out in the open as much. So, um, so ways to kind of protect them. And this is kind of really how you want to design your space. Um, so kind of thinking about it. And this is really where I'd love to like kind of show how we have our designs. So you can kind of get some ideas of that. It's a pretty um, in-depth design that I think a lot of backyard gardeners don't, backyard chicken keepers don't really need to have as much, but um, I like it because we have a fully contained run. Um, but some good ways to protect them is kind of at night. Um, if you don't have a fully protected run is to close up and latch all the doors. Um, chickens will naturally want to go into their coop at night um, because that's just their safe space. They can't see at night. So before it gets too dark, um, unless something stops them, they're gonna be going into their coop at night and so they'll all be always be there. So that makes it really convenient for if you have a coop and maybe you don't have a fully protected run, maybe you just have like a low fence or something. Um, by the time it gets to night, um, they're already all in the coop and you can just go over and kind of either close the door or something like that and they're already all in there. Um, you wanna make sure you don't have any holes and this is definitely like in your coop or different things like that. Um, thinking of like any snakes. Um, I have heard of some like pretty large rats sometimes killing chickens, though that's sometimes they also are just kind of hanging out in coops. And if you want to kind of keep it a little bit cleaner, filling in any holes as well is a good idea. Um, and then if you are going to use chicken wire, um, so this picture right here is really nice because um, we got just plain chicken wire here on the top. And then we actually have a hardware cloth and chicken wire combination on the bottom. Um, I find the chicken wire, we kind of redid our design of ours because our flock, um, we're pretty sure a dog dug its way underneath um, the chicken wire um, and got into the uh, coop and run and killed all of our chickens. This was about four, four or five years ago. So we had to kind of redesign a lot of things. And one of the big things we did was putting hardware cloth on the bottom. I think it's like four feet or so of the of the run outside um, and then just kind of overall things to be paying attention to with predators is just you know checking for tunnels um, and then in the run so that run is i didn't really define this at the beginning but it's easier when we're in person kind of pointing it out but your coop is basically where your chickens are going to be living they're laying their eggs where they get their food where they usually get their water and then the run is just their outdoor space um, so some people's runs um, at their houses might just be their whole backyard. Um, other people's runs might be a, like a low fence that just kind of contains them in a certain space or like ours, which is a fully enclosed run. Um, and so it's just that the run is a kind of common um, just description of kind of the outdoor space for a chicken. So, but in those runs for places for those chickens to get outside, you wanna make sure they have something they can get under, whether, um, there's trees or even just like an umbrella or something that can kind of keep them protected so that if they do see a hawk or an owl above, they can get under and feel safe. So, and then kind of as we're thinking about the design, first you wanna make sure you have chickens. Um, so in St. Louis City, um, yes, you can. So since 2017, we, the city of St. Louis with Quite a bit of work from I know Missouri Coalition for the Environment and a couple other um, nonprofit organizations and advocacy organizations got a updated bill on chickens passed. Um, previously, um, chickens were considered I think just part of household animals and you could only have I think four per lot, so it would be including dogs, cats, and chickens. So now you can have eight chickens or fowl per lot. You can look up their definition of what fowl is. Um, and there are some just some basic um, requirements. Um, they're pretty low, and like you can, you usually if you're designing your space, you're probably going to have enough um, off of it. But they just want to make sure you have four square foot of indoor space and ten feet per chicken. Um, so that ten square feet of outdoor of enclosed outdoor space could be um, just like outdoor um, something fenced in. So, and then you can't have roosters. Uh, they make too much noise. Um, and then most of St. Louis County, and this is really tough, is just like, it's also a yes, though you should be checking your local regulations if you're in a specific city in um, St. Louis County, just because uh, while they may allow it, they might have specific rules. I know some cities, even in St. Louis County, have specific 
Like they need somebody to come out and take a look at your coop before you do it. Um, and so just making sure you check with your local regulations and making sure you're allowed to have it. Um, the easy chicken, um, so on this link, so I'll be sending this presentation out afterwards to everybody that attended. Um, so you can click on these links that are embedded in here. Um, they have a nice um, list of regulations and I just checked right before the presentation and that hyperlink is still active. So, um, and I do, yeah, these are our chickens. Um, we are exempt from the eight chickens per lot. So we can have a little bit more. So where to start with our chickens? Where do we go? You're interested in getting them? So I would say first, um, before you even get your chicks, I'd say build a coop for your chickens. Um, it might take a little bit longer, um, There's, but getting that done first um, and really making sure and solidifying that design at the beginning will just make taking care of chickens so much easier. They're already very easy, but designing a nice coop with run um, can really save you a ton of time in the future. And then all you're really doing is occasionally cleaning it, replacing the water, adding some feed, and then collecting all your eggs. Um, there's tons and tons of designs. So I'm gonna show a couple here, but like really, um, it's really kind of how it fits your space. What are you up to? But I'll talk about some specific things you do need to include. Um, so first, obviously every coop, you pretty much need a feeder, some type of way to get them food. Um, you can buy lots of different versions of these. I think we just have a standard kind of um, one where you dump it in the middle, comes out the sides, um, water. Um, and I actually do have some kind of opinions on how to do water, how to get water to chickens. And we'll talk about it because um, with preventing it from freezing, there's a bunch of different ways. Um, you will need some roosting areas and then you will need a couple nest boxes as well. And we'll talk about what those are. So kind of for feeders and waters, for feeder, for food, a lot of options. You really can just kind of give them anything, um, something to hold that food. I know quite a few chicken, people that have chickens that have had them for years and they just use a bowl. Um, but you can get a little bit nicer one that hangs um, kind of however you wanna do it. Um, and then for water, um, so one thing here is if you're in St. Louis or really anywhere that it'll get, it'll freeze over the winter, you need to figure out how you're going to provide water to them um, that will stay, that you won't have freeze over the winter, whether you replace the water every day um, and like fully replace it and put something new in, um, or you put like a bird bath heater in, and that's what we do. Um, and so for that, we actually, so this one on the right is the one we use for pretty much the majority of the season when it's not freezing, when there's no chance for frost, um, cause it's really nice. Um, you just fill the top, the chickens can just peck at this little kind of yellow parts and the water comes out. Um, it's really easy for them to use. Um, the one problem with this though, is when it freezes, even if you have a little bird feeder, um, like water heater in there, um, these little cups will freeze as well as the like mechanism that opens up. So we actually have to then switch um, to another one, which is a bottom feeder one, um, which has some hamster, it's like the little hamster things um, to fill up water. Um, and I found that also kind of freezes a little bit, but not as often as this one. Um, there's other ones that just have standing water in it. And that might be the best solution definitely over the winter. It's just having something that hangs where there's water exposed on the sides. Um, and I think I have some pictures of that where you can put some type of heater in. If you already have your chicken coop heated, which is like, I feel like much more upgraded than others, um, then I guess you probably don't have to worry about it, but most people don't. So you will need to think about how to prevent the water from freezing in your coop. You will need some roosting areas. Um, these don't need to be anything fancy. Um, they do like to roost at night and they like to be up off the ground since they can't see um, being up a little bit off the ground makes them, keeps them safe. Um, so usually it's about a foot and a half to three feet. Um, you can go all the way up almost to five feet, but then any taller than that, they really can't get up to that easily and they don't want to. Um, make sure they're about three inches wide. So a two by four is like a perfect board just to use for it. Um, so that's what we have here. Um, they sleep, they like to sleep with their feet flat. They don't want to be curling over something. So three inches is um, about what you want. Um, and then don't, pretty much the only kind of rule on that. So other than the three inches is you don't want to use metal um, really because over the winter, you don't want um, that metal to get cold and then cause frostbite on their feet. 
uh, because over the winter, even when it's still cold, they'll have their feet resting there and then they'll kind of sit on top of those feet to keep them warm. Um, and if, that, if you have metal there, um, that metal will be so cold, it'll um, give them frostbite on your feet. So a two by four is like a perfect piece of wood to use for that, but you can obviously use anything else you want. Um, but it's just a cheap, simple, well, kind of cheap right now, but cheaper solution than others. Um, and then nesting boxes, so use the same picture here because it's our coop. Um, usually you want about a box for every three to four hens, though if you have chickens or if you know anybody with chickens and they have quite a few, um, they'll tell you that pretty much they all lay the eggs and the eggs in one box. It doesn't matter how many chickens you have. Um, so we have, what have we got? We got 12 um, boxes right here. I think we have now uh, we've got 11 chickens right now, and there's usually only two of the boxes that they are laying in at all. So, um, which makes it kind of funny when they are all kind of laying at the same time, they want to kind of push each other out of the way so they can get in there and lay their egg. Um, but when you're building the nesting boxes, yeah, one for every three to four hens, you want to place it in kind of the darkest or quietest place in the coop. So you don't want it right next to maybe like the entrance where they're coming in and out. Um, because if you do that, they might just choose not to be laying eggs in those nesting boxes because they don't find it as comfortable. Um, so we just have it off to the right side when you walk in. Um, you might need to go a little bit larger than 12 inches if you get a bigger breed, but though like pretty much all those breeds I think I listed at the beginning, um, they're all pretty standard size. 12 inch cube is, is what we use, it works great. Um, though you don't wanna go bigger other than like, if you don't need to go bigger than 12 inches, I wouldn't go any bigger because if you do get too big, um, you'll find the chickens will try to squeeze them. Like another chicken will try to squeeze itself in when the other one's laying. Um, it's just not really good for them. It also can encourage them to be pecking at each other. And we want to kind of avoid that as well. So a 12 inch cube is kind of a nice size. Um, and then it also kind of prevents them from kicking out any of that bedding or any of that in there. So if it's too big, it's a lot easier for them to do it. So um, I've seen people use buckets pretty often um, where they turn it on their side and they cut out the back and they let the chickens go in that way. A bucket's a really nice size for that. Um, it's a good, really, a really good reuse um, for it. Some other coop design ideas to be thinking about. So first, um, after you've kind of designed your coop, what is your run going to look like? Are you going to be fully enclosing it? Is it going to be just open? Is your run just your backyard? What are we, what are you thinking about? Um, will you need to let the chickens out in the morning if you lock them up in at night? So the nice thing with our fully enclosed run is we don't have to, it's just open because the whole run is fully enclosed even on top. Um, and then, so this is MU extensions recommendations, but you do also want to follow um, what your city regulations are if there are any, but about one square foot of floor space in the coop per chicken, and then about 10 square feet of outdoor space um, per chicken. So, um, and then how will you get those eggs? So if we look at these ones, these nesting boxes, um, it's not a lot of work to just kind of shove a chicken out of the way to grab the eggs. Um, but some people, um, when they're building it, do a little kind of um, flap that can kind of come down on the outside. So you could actually be outside the coop um, and grab the eggs, which is a nice little, like makes it a lot faster. Um, I would say that's really great and it makes it a lot more convenient, but it is nice for you to be kind of checking in on your chickens a little bit more. So that's kind of what we use as the daily, just checking to get eggs is also just kind of, you walk in, you're kind of paying attention to how all your chickens are doing as well. Um, so, but, Thinking about how you're gonna kind of, kind of get eggs, that's kind of what that um, bucket sideways of some people cut the back out and then also do kind of a flap so that they can get the chicken, get the eggs that way too. So. And then some other designs. So this is um, a nice little fully enclosed run off the side of a chicken coop, um, fully enclosed even with the top with chicken wire, which is a really nice protection. Um, this one also has that kind of combined run and it's a little bit smaller. Um, so it's kind of looks like more of like a based off of a shed design, which is nice. Um, this is what right here, this little red feeder right here is one of these water feeders I was talking about um, where you can basically put um, a heater in it and the water will be kind of coming out the bottom and basically the heater will keep the water from freezing. 
Um, and then you can even go smaller. So this design here I've seen quite often and people have done this. You can get some really cool designs with kind of reusing palettes to make this design. The nice thing with this is, and there's a reason it's off the ground is you can, you're kind of keeping a lot of critters out of it. So um, rats, mice, things like that can't really get in, same with snakes. Um, and they have their nice cute little walk um, way down to get out. Um, and then in this design, they even have this kind of small little enclosed run, though it looks like they probably open it up for everybody else as well. Um, and they have a little side door for you to kind of reach in and stuff like that. Um, one thing with this design is thinking about how you would clean it, because um, you do need to be cleaning your coop out, pulling all the straw out um, and replacing it. Um, so if you can't walk all the way in it, making sure you can kind of reach all the corners um, to clean it out. So a little bit more about designing to keep predators out, because I mean, designing at the beginning is pretty important. Um, so what we do for ours um, is we have a wooden base. So having a wooden base of the coop is nice. You don't have to if you don't want, but that's pretty, it's a nice way to keep any tunnels from coming up. Um, if you can keep it off the ground, like I was mentioning in that previous picture is really nice. And then if you're fencing in your run and like fully fencing it in or really thinking about trying to keep some of those ground um, predators out, um, I find hardware cloth is a little bit better than chicken wire. Um, and what we did to keep any wild dog, like any feral dogs or whatever out was we buried, um, we basically dug about three feet around the whole run and we buried that hardware cloth and it's done a great job from there. Um, and then we put like some cinder blocks on one side. And then we even put, I think some two by sixes at the bottom as well. Um, and so this is kind of a long, a wide shot of our enclosed run, um, which makes it really nice. And so that chicken wire is the whole thing. And then the hardware cloth goes to this part as well. So some other kind of nice design additions if you want um, is, having maybe a whole separate section of both your coop and maybe even your run um, to where you can separate chickens if you need to. Um, we have one where it's basically our coop is cut in half and it's kind of also our run is cut in half. Um, this design is really nice because if we have a new chicken that we get, which like, so we've occasionally gotten chickens kind of off the street that nobody's claimed um, and to kind of integrate them into the rest of the flock, it's nice to have them separated, but they can see each other. Um, so doing that, if one gets sick, also separating them is a good way to make sure the rest of the flock doesn't get sick, um, or if they're just kind of fighting in general. Um, we also do it nicely because then we can let up this side of the run fully grow up with plants. We can open it up, the chickens love it, they eat kind of all the plants while this side kind of recovers and grows back from there. So. Um, thinking about easy ways to get eggs, like I was talking about, is it tall enough to get inside to clean? And then do you have electricity or a plug or some way to keep the water from freezing? So some other nice design additions as well. So and this is kind of that separation from inside the coop. All right, so we've kind of designed our chicken, our coop, thought about our run, thought about all these, if we can even have chickens. So now where do we get the chickens? Um, so there's quite a few places. Um, you can either order online, you can just go to a farm store, um, some garden stores, definitely around this time of year have some. Um, around STL, I mean, there's a lot more than this, um, but I just kind of listed some um, Fenton Feed Mill, OK Hatchery, um, the Chicken Whisperers, Second Hen, um, and just want to make a plug about them. Um, they're a nonprofit that basically takes hens that um, they partner with a couple commercial farmers and they take hens from those farms um, and instead of them being killed, they're actually given out um, to people that want to get chickens um, and they will still be laying eggs for a couple more years. Um, so if you're kind of new to chickens though, uh, I would probably recommend getting somewhere else. And then once you've kind of had them for a couple of years, maybe looking at getting into second hand um, or just reaching out. I have links to their Facebook page where you can reach out. And then a little outside of St. Louis um, is McMurray Hatchery. Um, I think they're in Iowa. The only reason I plug them is because you can get um, fully vaccinated pullets or really like maybe even a little younger than a pullet um, from them versus a lot of other places. It's hard to get fully vaccinated chickens, um, which isn't terrible, but if you get fully vaccinated ones, 
you have a better chance of kind of the whole flock making it through. Um, and you really, it's hard to vaccinate them yourself because usually they sell the vaccines in like giant quantities that a backyard chicken person won't really eat. So, all right. So, and kind of where should you be hatching your, should you start your chicks, pullets are getting full grown. I really say, depending on how much, how much work you want to put into it, um, really depends on how old the chickens, if you get old chickens, they will just do their thing. You just got to take care of them. Um, for hatching and starting some chicks, they might be un, well, if you're hatching them, they will be unsexed. So you will need to figure out what to do with the males. Um, if you're getting starting chickens, chicks, make sure they are sexed. Um, sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. If you do get a pullet, which is this picture on the right, and I apologize for the sound if you can't hear me. Um, but if you get pullets, um, it's these kind of teenagers on the right, they will be sexed as well as obviously full grown chickens. So you will only be getting um, the hens, you won't be getting any roosters. And like I was mentioning, think about vaccination. Some places do vaccinate or offer to, you can pay a little extra. If you have the option, I highly recommend paying for it. Um, I've heard quite a few stories of people getting chicks and then kind of losing the whole flock because some type of disease kind of went through and killed them all. Um, but that's not always an option. So just some, kind of something to pay attention to if you can't. So, so if you're starting chicks, um, you can sometimes get them vaccinated, though it's a little tough to find them, but make sure you're getting sexed chicks first. Um, that's probably the bigger priority so that you don't have to figure out what to do with some roosters. So pretty much every place you'll get them, they should be giving you a guide. Um, a lot of this is stuff that I know, but also kind of just pulled from guides on the internet. So um, you can also just kind of find a lot of this, but pretty much when you are starting chicks, they do need to stay warm when you get them. Um, usually 90 to 95 degrees for the first week. Um, so really make sure you have a thermometer like this one right here in where you're starting the chicks and where you're keeping them. Um, so you can really make sure you pay attention to that temperature. Um, you'll gradually kind of be lowering that temperature every week until you get to 70 degrees. Um, again, those guides will kind of give you help on that. Um, and usually what you do is you kind of move your heat lamp or your heat bulb away, farther away from where you're starting the chicks. Um, look for a red bulb um, when you're using a heat bulb. This is because if chicks do, um, I think it's really because if they start to kind of peck at somebody or somebody gets kind of bloody, if they can't see it so that they won't kind of all go and kill this other, like one of the chicks. Because um, when chickens see any other chick, chicken like in distress or bleeding or something like that, um, there's like a natural instinct where they kind of all kind of gang up on that chicken. So having a red bulb will make it so they can't tell that one is kind of bleeding or has something wrong with it. So, um, and then a smaller light at night can also prevent some piling. Um, so chickens will kind of, they'll all kind of group, chicks will be grouping together um, to stay warm. If you find they're doing that a lot, you can add in a little bit of an extra, like a smaller light closer to where you can kind of spread them out a little bit more. Um, a lot of people do these in their bathtubs um, when they're getting them, but a large box can also work pretty well too. Um, so here's a nice picture, some chicks kind of all clumping together, just trying to stay warm. You can see that they're all kind of clumping into that heat. Um, you wanna try to avoid as much trying to get them into that piling as much because um, that chick kind of right in the, at the first can get smothered from the other chicks. Um, when you first get them on that first day, kind of lay that bottom with newspaper, put some chick starter on the ground so they can kind of be scratching and doing stuff like that. You will need to teach them to drink. Um, so you'll need to make sure you dip the beak of each chick. So like each, each chick in the water um, before you leave them. Um, pretty much once you did it once, they pretty much get it. Um, and then after that first day, you can kind of use some rice hulls, wood shavings or straws, litter. Um, it's just nice to use newspaper at the beginning to just kind of familiarize them and get them into it. Um, and then eventually, again, following a lot of these guides, you'll need to add some grit to their feet after a few days. Um, and then after about four weeks or so, um, they can be moved outside. And really, you can start introducing them really after two weeks, um, if it is warm enough. So like with our weather now, you could start doing that. Um, make sure you're out there, only do it for a few hours at a time and make sure they're kind of safe. Um, and then 
definitely for chicks, pasting up is a common problem um, where just basically the manure sticks to the back of the chick. Um, just using a warm rag, you can also kind of dunk them in like a bowl of water. Um, and usually that will help kind of wipe that off. So that's kind of it with chicks. There's a ton of guides on it. Um, so I don't want to go too deep into it. Um, but a lot of people that's usually where they're starting is kind of taking care of chicks. Um, so if that's what you're doing, that's what a lot of people do. Um, so taking care of adult chickens. So it's a lot easier once you get, once they get to adulthood, um, they do a lot of fun things like this, climbing on people's heads. Um, so usually chickens start laying between kind of 16 to 24 weeks, four to six months or so. Um, they'll naturally want to be laying in the boxes that you build. Um, though there are a few techniques to encourage them to lay in the boxes really if they aren't. Um, so these can be, if you find they're kind of laying in a spot you don't want, um, first figure out why they're doing it. So maybe it's because your boxes are in a space that isn't quiet or dark, um, but if they are, and maybe that other space is, putting something in the way is like the first thing to do. So like if they're laying in the corner, maybe put a cardboard box just in the corner to block them from getting to it. Um, usually that kind of does it. Um, also, like we still have some chickens that lay in a couple corners of the coop. It's, I find it's not a big deal. Um, if they're kind of laying, I've never seen them ever laid in like places you really don't want or laying outside. But if they are, um, you really want to think about, that's kind of where you need to think about that design of your space. And like, why are they laying out in the grass or outside versus laying in your coop? Is there an animal in that coop? Is there a reason they can't, maybe they can't get to the boxes. Maybe they're being, um, they have some problem with the rest of the flock where the rest of the flock's not letting them in. Um, there's quite a few things it could be, um, but it usually is an indication of something bigger um, than just them enjoying to lay outside because they naturally want to lay in a cool, dark space that's kind of in a corner that they can sit on and protect. Um, and then keeping the coop clean. Um, so there's a lot of people have opinions on this, but usually we do ours about every three to six weeks. We have about 11 chickens or so in kind of a shed sized coop. Um, so that can kind of give you that idea of it, but really it's how messy, messy they are and how much you want them to be messy. Um, though the more often you clean it, the less chance of them getting sick because they're kind of pooping and just kind of walking all around in there. So um, usually when we clean it, it's we use straw for our base um, and it's a wooden floor. So we'll just pull all the straw out um, and then we'll just actually throw the straw back in the run um, and just kind of spread it out, which the chickens really like because then they kind of mess around with the straw. And then we just put a new fresh um, layer of straw down. Um, if you don't have access to straw, you can also use wood chips. Um, and then just some other things for keeping the coop clean. It's really good idea to keep any treats that you give them outside the coop. Um, Cause if you like throw watermelons to them or something, they're not gonna eat all of it. And so then it's gonna be rotting. So you wanna make sure it's outside and not in the coop. And then a few things of what you can't feed them. You can also find a ton of these lists, but um, pretty much all this, um, a lot of these are toxic, but then a couple specific things, um, whole eggshells, you can feed them crushed up eggshells. Usually people say crush them and dry them. Um, you just don't wanna give them whole eggshells because you really don't wanna encourage them to be eating eggs. Um, and so just make sure you crush it up. If you need to find, you need to give them some more calcium. Um, that's a really good, want, good way to do it. And I think I have a reason. I think we'll talk a little bit about that. So, and some say citrus. Um, I haven't found any problems with giving them any kind of citrus that we don't really give them a ton. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the list. So. And so then feeding your chickens, our chickens definitely prefer a chicken pellet over a chicken crumble. And if you buy any of these, you'll notice there's like a billion different types. The pellet is a lot bigger. For some reason, they just like won't even eat the crumble. Like I don't think they even recognize it as food. Um, and then when you are storing your feed, so when it's not in the coop, really you should store it in sealed containers. Um, you don't wanna encourage mice, rats, or things like that. We have big trash cans we store ours in. Um, I've seen kitty litter boxes. That's a great place to use it. Um, and then a fun little treat during the summer. Um, you can always freeze like berries or something that are kind of going bad in some ice and then they let them pick it out. Um, they absolutely love it. Um, that bright berry 
It's like super attractive for them. So I think I have some pictures, some videos, or you can give them some grapes, things like that. They love it. Um, chickens are, they're smart and not smart. Um, you can train them to do kind of a bunch of weird things. So like they love to jump on people, like ours like to climb on people's heads. Um, they like to jump up and get food. So we've kind of taught them a little bit of that. And then over the winter. So um, people have a lot of questions about what to do with chickens over the winter. Um, so first, St. Louis, I, we've had chickens for decades. We've never really added additional heat. Um, really, even we had some cold spells, I think, was it this past winter or the winter before? Um, and they still didn't get cold enough to really affect them. Um, chickens do, are, I find chickens are a lot more well adapted for the winter here than our summer. Um, they, you can tell um, they're pretty uncomfortable when it gets to 100 degrees, it's pretty humid. Um, but when it's cold, um, they have all, they have multiple layers of feathers, so they do pretty well. Um, they will start laying a lot less over the winter. It's really sunlight is that kind of um, really what kind of connects them with laying more. Um, so some like large scale farmers, but you can also do this at home, will add in some light into their coop um, to basically supplement that to kind of keep them with the laying. Um, like I was saying, use that, use like a bird bath heater or something to keep their water from freezing. Um, and really just over the winter, add some extra straw and bedding. Um, it's not really for them as much, like they're not going to be sitting on it because they'll be up on roosting spots, but it will just help kind of increase the insulation overall of your coop. Um, and then this is kind of where making sure that coop doesn't have any holes or gaps. You don't want cold air kind of flowing through it. You want a nice, well insulated space. And then a few other things. Um, so when you're introducing new chickens, if you can try never to introduce just one chicken by itself to the flock, though you don't always have the option, like we occasionally get them off the street. And so usually you don't get two off the street, you usually get one. Um, so we're introducing it one at a time. Um, but for that, you wanna make sure you can kind of keep them separated or you're just checking in on them because they chickens do have a pecking order. That's where it comes from. And so every chicken has a certain like list on it. And so when a new chicken gets introduced to the flock, um, they will pretty much have to fight with almost every chicken to figure out where they are. Um, and if they get too badly hurt, um, the chickens can kind of just gang up on them um, and can kill them. So that's really why we have that kind of separator, which is really nice. So for a couple of weeks, they can kind of see each other, they can interact. There still is kind of some fighting once they get introduced, but it um, is a lot more um, reduced. And then brooding chickens. So people have a lot of questions about brooding. Um, so brooding is really when the chickens are laying eggs in their boxes or kind of wherever, and they don't wanna leave those eggs because they imagine that the eggs um, are gonna, they think they're fertilized and they think they're going to hatch. Um, so they would, they'll just sit there, um, really just knocking a brooding chicken out of the way. So this chicken right here may be brooding. So just kind of pushing her out of the way. Um, we'll really get her out of there. Um, sometimes they really don't wanna move. So you have to just kind of grab her and move. Um, when you do that, they'll like make a lot of noise. I've never been pecked by one. Um, they put a lot of show into it, really make it seem like they're really angry, but then you move them out of the way. They kind of also just kind of snap out of that brooding and they just kind of go on with their day. Um, so you'll get this occasionally, just kind of move them out of the way. Um, and then it is, whenever you're kind of paying attention to your chicken and your eggs, pay attention to your chickens and just see how they're interacting. Um, if you find one chick, if you find some chickens are like either like just kind of very lethargic, they're just kind of sitting down a lot. They don't really aren't moving too much. They could be sick. Um, there could be a couple, I mean, it could be a lot of different things, but one thing that could be is they could be egg bound. Definitely when they're kind of young um, and they're just starting to lay their first eggs, this can happen. Um, and so basically the egg is stuck inside of them. Um, there's a couple of different ways to get it out. First though, is really a, the best way is just kind of soaking the chickens in kind of an Epsom salt bath um, for a couple of days in a row, um, usually about like 20 minutes or so. It's a lot easier with the second person to kind of help hold the chicken because they don't want to be in the bath. Um, but just doing that, we've had a couple that have been egg bound um, and luckily just the Epsom salt bath after a couple of days really did it. Um, but you can also, if that doesn't work, um, there are some good guides, but you will have to pretty much put on a um, 
plastic glove and just kind of pull out the egg because if that egg stays in there, it'll break um, and it'll pretty much kill the chicken. Um, so just making sure to be paying attention to that. Um, it's hard to like, you won't be able to tell if chickens, like your chicken hasn't been laying eggs unless you only have one. Um, so the best way to tell is just how they're kind of interacting and acting. Um, and then if they are sick, um, it's definitely where you probably should be talking to a vet or somebody like that because it's pretty hard to, to kind of diagnose that um, yourself, though kind of Googling and kind of paying attention as well. So. Um, and then I think there was something, oh, and then just, I don't think I mentioned this because usually I teach this in person. It's like when you're picking up a chicken, I probably should talk about this at the very beginning. When you're picking up a chicken, um, what you wanna do is make sure you kind of get your hands kind of, I think of it as catching a football, but like kind of like around this, around their neck um, and where your hands are around um, their wings so that when you kind of enclose around it, your hands are holding their wings in because if you grab it and your hands get under their wings and not over it, they'll just flap their wings and you won't be able to hold them. So you get your hands over their wings um, and then actually you can even tuck it kind of to your side where your side of your body is holding one set of wings in while your other hand is holding that wing in as well. So it's much easier to explain and practice when you're doing it in person. So if you come to see our chickens, we'll let you pick them up. So, um, you can also use chickens often in a garden, which is great, great for loosening soil. Definitely great if like at the end of the season, you just have a bunch of weeds or stuff to die, letting them in on that bed to just do it. They add fertilizer in um, and it's just a nice fun activity for them. We have this like little PVC made um, kind of cover to where it fits the size of a raised bed. You can just stick it on top and throw the chickens in. You can leave them in there for a couple hours. Um, and then they're only eating out of that bed too, which is nice. So they're not getting into a bed of stuff that we want to eat. So I think I have a nice little picture. Just a fun chicken eating grass. Um, they love to eat grass and greens. We have a compost bin here, which is kind of fun. So, um, and I think that is pretty much it. I, there's still, I think there's a couple things I probably missed talking about, but if you guys do have questions, start throwing them into the chat or into the Q&A or into the chat. I'll take a look at both. Um, this, this uh, well, this video will be uploaded, but then um, this presentation will be also sent out to everybody as well. Um, so you'll be able to click on all these links um, to be able to get to kind of that information. So while we have q and A, I I think I need to stop. Well, we'll just do the Q&A. So. so Courtney, how do you know if they are egg bound? Yeah, so that's, kind of, it's not really as easy to tell. You can tell sometimes also, not only with them kind of being lethargic and just kind of moving around as much and like, you can kind of tell the difference between that, that chicken and maybe some others that are like kind of following you around, definitely if you're providing them food often. Um, but they also seem to kind of get a little bit, um, I guess, inflamed. And so they're kind of like their feathers kind of stick out a little bit more. Um, uh, that's really how we noticed, how we notice on them is they just kind of see a little um, slow. They just kind of lay around as much. Um, and that was really it. Um, you can kind of tell, like, I mean, you can stick your finger up there and kind of feel for an egg. Um, eventually, there's also some good guides on how to do that too. So, all right. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions, we've got plenty of time. We don't have to, also if nobody else has questions though, we also can just kind of end early. Um, but I'm gonna stop the recording and we will.